Now, after a tumultuous weekend for the WWE, I'm sure they were looking forward to getting back to the business at hand. That business being boring the brakes off of us for three hours with Monday Night Raw. And I have to say, they did a good job for the most part of getting back to the business at hand. So it was a welcome distraction for the company, and they seized upon the opportunity to largely bore the brakes off of us, or at least me, for three hours on Monday night. Now, there were a couple things I liked, but in general, this was still a lousy show. You know, when the two participants involved with your main event at SummerSlam can't be bothered to be there, no matter what the reason or justification, you don't really have a whole lot of hope that the show is going to be any damn good. Let's be honest. If they can't be bothered to be there at Raw and care, why should you? I know a lot of people are talking about how bad the Oklahoma City crowd was for the show, and they were, but frankly, who could blame them? What the hell was there on this show that could really get you emotional, that could really entertain you? And frankly, what a sad indictment it, that is of Raw this week, that it seems like a lot of people are talking about the sorry-ass crowd reactions of Oklahoma City more than they are anything that actually happened on the show itself. At the beginning of the year, one of my predictions for WWE in 2015, I believe, was that Triple H was going to have at least 20 or more 15-minute promo segments. And I literally think that by the end of July, he's already far surpassed that number. It's another Raw that basically starts off with the same old authority crap. You've got Triple H and Stephanie getting themselves over, screw everything else. At least Stephanie wore a better dress this time, more flattering to her figure for sure. Seth Rollins doesn't really stand out. And you've got Cena acting like the bully. Cena acting like the villain. Cena acting like the jackass. And talking like a jackass. I understand the whole thing of the segments at the tone for the night. It was a theme of first-time matchups and this and that. They're trying to shake shit up. But, you know, for the in-ringers, the people that just love the in-ring action, this most certainly wasn't a good segment. For the people that enjoy the skits and the promos, the promo people, the character people, this wasn't a good segment. It was just a lame-ass segment. You know, you would think after the shit that happened that came out with Hogan over the weekend that the WWE would be bothered at least to kick off the show in an interesting, you know, kind of engaging type of way, or at least be bothered to try to write a good opening segment. I was mistaken. And we kick off the night's in-ring action with one of those first-time-ever matches. Whoopee! It's Dean Ambrose versus The Big Show. Why in the bluest of blue fucks did anybody in that company think it was a good idea to have Dean Ambrose job out to Big Show? Oh, but afterwards, Big Show runs through the freaking barricade, meaning Dean Ambrose, the only thing he did to him was get out of the way, and then Dean Ambrose is standing tall. Oh, my fucking Christ. We still have Big Show going over, people. Why? And sticking to the overly match-heavy theme of this week's Raw, which isn't unique to this week's Raw, because an overly match-heavy format is pretty much the format of every single Raw each and every single week. Neville does the best he can in the limited amount of time he can to entertain the people with what he does in the ring against Fandango, but you never really get any insight to the Neville character, so your engagement and investment in that character only runs so deep. And then for some reason, they're sending Stardust at him. And here's my big question. Is why is Cody Rhodes still Stardust? The people don't want to see Stardust. They want to see Cody Rhodes. It's like the WWE intentionally is looking at it and saying, hey, we bring back Cody Rhodes. We give a little effort to him. He might get over a little bit. So we don't want to fucking do that. Let's go with the character we really didn't care about much to begin with. Let's really not do anything with him other than just have him toil in fucking hell. The people want stardust. <sighs> another week and another time for people to get sucked in by this Divas Revolution garbage and to try and overrate and overinflate this crap. Well, no matter how much the presentation you feel has changed, at the end of the day, it's the same old shit. Like, for example, they're interviewing Sasha Banks, and you're giving a nice little background into your NXT Women's Champion, and that's all good. But she's sitting there and talking about how she's aligning herself with the best. If you were aligning yourself with the best in the Divas division, wouldn't you be aligning yourself with Nikki Bella, the, oh, I don't know, fucking Divas champion, who's pretty close to passing AJ Lee's reign as the longest Divas champion in history? 
She's aligned herself with Naomi and Tamina Snuka. And based off of a character standpoint, what in the fuck would they know about being the best if they have a combined zero Divas Championships? Where that belt has a Kelly Kelly tendency of running through every damn body, it's managed to skip both of them. So why the hell would the NXT champion want to align herself with those two people? It makes no sense. But again, this whole Divas Revolution crap makes absolutely no sense. It's like this knee-jerk, reflex, panic, reactionary, spur-of-the-moment, flavor-of-the-month type shit. Paige is sitting there... Feuding with the Bellas, she wants people to align with her, but nobody does. So that way we'll bring in Charlotte and Becky Lynch to be back up. But at the same point in time, we bring in Sasha, so that way there's Naomi and Tamina, and this whole shit doesn't make any fucking sense. And even what they're doing on television makes absolutely no fucking sense. The hell are you building to? Literally, the only thing they're building to is stalling and buying time, so that way they can come up with excuses to stretch out Nikki Bella's Divas title reign until she passes AJ Lee, so that way she has the longest one, then they're going to have her drop the strap to somebody, and then they can move the fuck on. And I don't care what anybody says. While one of the matches was featured in a one-hour main event slot, and that's good, it's still the same shit. Yes, the matches are getting a little bit more time, but it's still ultimately the same shit. The writing makes absolutely no fucking sense. They book the characters in a way that makes absolutely no fucking sense, and it's all matches. It's the same shit they always do with the fucking divas. It's match, 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 set up to a fucking match. I enjoyed the hell out of the Rusev's blonde segment. Oh, shit. Yeah, that was classic. I didn't necessarily it was classic good. It was semi-classic train wreck, but at this point in time, classic train wreck could be equally, if not more so, entertaining than classically good. So I'll fucking take it. When Rusev wasn't stumbling all over himself and his words in the fucking English language, I was laughing my ass off at some of the shit he said. That's right. Beautiful and obedient. I don't know if Butterface is beautiful, but the obedient part, rock on, brother. And then, you know, we get the introduction of Dog Ziggler. And I sat there at first and I was kind of confused. And I said, based off of the recent trend, is this the newest WWE diva? Kind of looks the part. But then when he said it's going to be called Dog Ziggler, I said, hot damn, already just that dog looking there and semi-shivering has instantly done something that is more entertaining than anything Dolph Ziggler has done over the past five years. And dear Jeff, how dare you say that? We fucking hate you. Dolph Ziggler rules. Guy Liner, FTW. Dog Ziggler, FTW, motherfucker. I enjoy whenever the primetime players end up on commentary because I know what's going to happen. I really don't give a shit about what's going on in the ring. Like, I didn't really care about the Lucha Dragons and Los Matadores and their match looked like choreographed crap as far as I'm concerned. But Darren Young is pretty much going to be quiet, and Tigus O'Neil to me, is going to steal the show like so often freaking does, frankly. And he's going to sit there and in particular do something that I love, love, and that's poon and shit talk JBL each and every fucking time. As far as I'm concerned at this point, I want Titus O'Neil on commentary every single goddamn week because at least I know I'm guaranteed something on the show that I'm going to like. I'm going to laugh at something. I'm going to have fun with something. Titus O'Neil, goddammit, is one of the few redeeming qualities I have for WWE's product right now. So one of the big happenings on Raw this week is the reuniting of Luke Harper with Bray Wyatt. Sans Eric Rowan, the Wyatt family is back together again. Apparently we don't have a third member yet, but apparently we're getting one soon, and whoopee! One thing stood out to me when Luke Harper was talking. I said, he doesn't sound like I think he should. Or in particular, he doesn't sound the way that I think maybe his character should. It was just odd. And again, maybe that's me just being off on Jerk Mountain. I don't know, but it just sounded odd. And what he was saying, it just came across weird. And again, sounded odd. And not the Wyatt family type of odd that would be good. Just odd and kind of, frankly, out of place. But that kind of describes this whole shit of reuniting Luke Carper and Bray Wyatt together for whatever the fuck reason. These guys are in the same exact damn spot that they were two years ago when they first came on the scene on that road to SummerSlam 2013. Think about it. They're in the exact same damn position. More victims of the WWE's lack of long-term vision, lack of commitment to creating new stars, lack of willingness to create new stars, lack of, frankly, knowledge and know-how of how to create any new freaking stars. Bray Wyatt and Luke Harper, the Wyatt family, are in the exact same position on the card as they are were two years ago. They 
didn't move up and continue to progress up, especially Bray Wyatt. They didn't move all the way down. They just stayed right where they fucking were. At this point in time, in order to get ahead in the WWE, frankly, your first match, you got to win the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Otherwise, you don't have a fucking chance in the world 99.5% of the damn time. I mean, two years later, Bray Wyatt's still saying the st same stupid crap. He's still being presented in the same stupid-ass way. You're not evolving the character. You're not changing the character. You haven't progressed the character in his path in any way, shape, or damn form. It's just stupid, and it's frustrating when I see it, because I'm like, Luke Harper deserves better, and Bray Wyatt most certainly deserves better, and we as fans definitely deserve better in this shit. It does usually piss me off when the WWE throws out what I think could be at least a somewhat decent money match at a big pay-per-view on a random Raw or SmackDown, but at least I'll say with Kevin Owens versus Randy Orton, you got a little bit of a taste of what it could be, but not too much. You know Sheamus is going to get involved since he's out there on commentary. Um, he gets involved. Nobody jobs. Then Cesaro comes out to make the save, and holy Christ, nobody has to put anybody over. Nobody looks stupid. You get one heel to get some heat on himself, and all the while you get the other baby face and Cesaro to look good as well. You're getting heat on Owens. You're getting some baby face reactions for Randy Orton. It's like a well-done segment. Everybody fucking wins. It doesn't have to be spectacular sometimes. Just execute and hit on the basics. And they did this. If they did a little more of this more consistently, the show would be so much better than it is. You know what's really sad is that Seth Rollins cashed in Money in the Bank at WrestleMania. The first person to ever do that. He walked out of WrestleMania 31, your biggest and most important show of the year, as the WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Yet as time continues to go along more and more, you understand that in the WWE's eyes right now, the real WWE World Heavyweight Championship is around John Cena's waist. Seth Rollins just happens to have the one that has that label. Cena's their guy. Whether or not you think he's been pushed on the card, he fucking hasn't. It's all a deception. It's the great Cena deception, the great Cena lie. It's all about feeding the fucking never-ending, never-dying John Cena monster. And, you know, I guess here's my thing from the WWE. If Cena was such a big star, then why aren't you building SummerSlam around him? Why isn't he the main event of SummerSlam? If he's such a big star, how come he wasn't the main event of WrestleMania 31? If he's such a big star, how come he wasn't the main event of WrestleMania 30 and the show wasn't built around him? If he's such a big star, how come your ratings are at a level that is usually reserved over the past couple of years for when Monday Night Football kicks off, and we're still another almost month and a half away from that. Whatever. You had to know once the shit went down with Hogan, I knew it deep down in the back, deep roving recesses of my freaking warp mind, that this meant in some way, shape, or form, John Cena's granted a wish to a make-a-wish kid. John Cena's done this. Hulk Hogan mad. WWE lose money, so John Cena's gonna be standing loud, proud, and tall at the end of the night, and you had to know this was fucking coming. You had to know this was gonna happen. I mean, if you think the U.S. champion is more important, if you think that belt is better because Cena has it, then just make the U.S. title your most important title officially. Call that your title. Call that your world title. Book it as the main event on every pay-per-view. You know, seriously. I mean, what's the point? There's just no point with anything fucking Cena does. His promos are largely stale. His matches are largely the same routine. Botch heavy. The guy, after all these years, still can't figure out a way how to hide his fucking calling of the matches. There's absolutely no flow to anything that happens. It's get to this spot, to get to this spot, to get to this spot. No selling a bound. All types of near falls and false finishes. And LOL, Cena wins. And in this particular case, what even makes it worse is freaking Cena has the only real war wound you could see with the freaking broken nose. But he's making Rollins, your WWE World Heavyweight Champion, tap out to the STF. You're tapping out Rollins on a Raw at the beginning of a feud between these two. This is not the culmination of some great story. This is not 
a pivotal moment at a big show like a SummerSlam or even a Night of Champions. You're doing this on the main event of fucking Raw. With very, very little build-up to it. All the while, you're having Cena clearly act like the villain in this case. And Rollins comes across, once again, as a sympathetic individual, as every person that ever faces Cena fucking does. If you're going to have this type of attitude and this type of mindset when it comes to your product and when it comes to John Cena, just give him every fucking title. He's fucking Nikki, so the Divas title's his. He's got the U.S. title. Ryback can't wrestle. Just fucking hand it over to Cena. Have Cena be the tag team champion. Not with anybody else, just by him fucking self. Because who the fuck could beat John Cena? Jesus Christ. And damn you, Hogan, this is all your fault. I rest this squarely at the feet of Hulk Hogan, brother. Because this is all his fault. Well, partially, because you know deep down the WWE thinks this makes for great television every single fucking week. Cena blows through everybody, and it's awesome. And then the ratings come in, you're like, ah, what happened? Oh, it must have been fucking Rusev. It's all his fault. It's all Dean Ambrose's fault. It's everybody's fault, but John Cena, because we fucking love him, because he grants wishes for kids, and he does all the charities, and ah, fuck off. Don't even waste our time with the match between the two of these guys. I mean, and even the arrogance of sitting there and having Cena defend the U.S. title. You're making it where the U.S. title, again, is more important than the WWE World Heavyweight Championship because that's the belt that's being defended. I mean, you didn't even do that. You know, if you're just going to fucking sit there and have Cena win the title at SummerSlam, just do it on fucking Raw then. You already had to make Rollins tap out, at least give some type of shock value where people didn't see it coming, at least on that fucking night. Have people really buzzing heading into SummerSlam. I mean, it, it clearly looks like you're going to do it fucking anyways, and there's no way anybody's going to believe that Seth Rollins could beat him. And then, of course, doing your typical wishy-washy Cena can't look bad finish is going to be a fucking abomination and a joke. I mean, the only way Cena can win the, lose that U.S. title at this point in time is to win that WWE World Heavyweight Championship just so that way he can forfeit the U.S. title or merge them together and then he can carry that belt into fucking WrestleMania 32. Aw, oh, son of a bitch, wouldn't you know? That sure seems like that's going to be the WWE's plan at this point, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Ugh. This is all Hogan's fault! They had their WWE World Heavyweight Champion tap out. Not just get pinned, not get beat into fluke, not get counted out, not get disqualified, not have the babyface get counted out or disqualified. They had their WWE World Heavyweight Champion at the beginning of a potential storyline arc between him and the United States Champion tap out to said United States Champion. Seth Rollins tapped out. Why? What possible good could this do? What possible purpose does it serve? Absolutely none. It's just another excuse for the WWE to put Cena over as the monster, and then they can sit there and look and feel better because, oh my God, maybe Cena will move a couple of more kitty shirts this week, and it'll be awesome! No, not really.